The Politics of Experience and the Bird of Paradise by R.D. Lang Chapter 2 The Psychotherapeutic Experience Asterisk From the Point of View of the Psychotherapist In the last 20 years, psychotherapy has developed both in theory and in practice in complex ways. And yet, through all this tangled complexity and sometimes confusion, it is impossible, in the words of Pasternak, not to fall ultimately, as into a heresy, into unheard of simplicity. In the practice of psychotherapy, the very diversities of method have made the essential simplicity more clear. The irreducible elements of psychotherapy are a therapist, a patient, and a regular and reliable time and place. But given these, it is not so easy for two people to meet. We all live on the hope that authentic meeting between human beings can still occur. Psychotherapy consists in the paring away of all that stands between us, the props, masks, roles, lies, defenses, anxieties, projections, and interjections, in short, all the carryovers from the past, transference and countertransference, that we use by habit and collusion, wittingly or unwittingly, as our currency for relationships. It is this currency, these very media, that recreate and intensify the conditions of alienation that originally occasioned them. The distinctive contribution of psychoanalysis has been to bring to light these importations, carryovers, compulsive repetitions. The tendency now among psychoanalysts and psychotherapists is to focus not only on transference, not only on what has happened before, but on what has never happened before, on what is new. Thus, in practice, the use of interpretations to reveal the past, or even to reveal the past in the present, may be used as only one tactic, and, in theory, there are efforts to understand better and to find words for the non-transference elements in psychotherapy. The therapist may allow himself to act spontaneously and unpredictably. He may set out actively to disrupt old patterns of experience and behavior. He may actively reinforce new ones. One hears now of therapists giving orders, laughing, shouting, crying, even getting up from that sacred chair. Zen, with its emphasis on illumination achieved through the sudden and unexpected, is a growing influence. Of course, such techniques in the hands of a man who has not unremitting concern and respect for the patient could be disastrous. Although some general principles of these developments can be laid down, their practice is still, and indeed must always be, for the man who has both quite exceptional authority and the capacity to improvise. I shall not enumerate all the many practical varieties of psychotherapy, long and short, brief, intensive, experiential, directive and non-directive, those that utilize the conscious expanding drugs or other adjuvants, and those that use, as it were, nothing but persons. I wish rather to consider in more detail the critical function of theory. These lines of growth that seem to expand centrifugally in all directions have intensified the need for a strong, firm, primary theory that can draw each practice and theory into relation to the central concerns of all forms of psychotherapy. In the last chapter, I outlined some of the fundamental requirements of such a theory, namely, that we need concepts which both indicate the interaction and inter-experience of two persons and help us to understand the relation between each person's own experience and his own behavior within the context of the relationship between them. And we must in turn be able to conceive of this relationship within the relevant contextual social systems. Most fundamentally, a critical theory must be able to place all theories and practices within the scope of a total vision of the ontological structure of being human. What help are the prevailing theories of psychotherapy to us? Here, it would be misleading to delineate too sharply one school of thought from another. Within the mainstream of orthodox psychoanalysis, and even between the different theories of object relationships in the UK, Fairbairn, Winnicott, Melanie Klein, Bion, there are differences of more than emphasis. Similarly, within the existential school or tradition, Binswanger, Boss, Caruso, Frankel, every theoretical idiom could be found to play some part in the thinking of at least some members of any school. At worst, there are the most extraordinary theoretical mixes of learning theory, ethology, system theory, communications analysis, 
information theory, transactional analysis, interpersonal relations, object relations, games theory, and so on. Freud's development of metapsychology changed the theoretical context we now work in. To understand with sympathy the positive value of metapsychology, we have to consider the intellectual climate in which it was first developed. Others have pointed out that it drew its impetus from the attempt to see man as an object of natural scientific investigation, and thus to win acceptance for psychoanalysis as a serious and respectable enterprise. I do not think such a shield is now necessary, or even that it ever was, and the price paid when one thinks in metapsychological terms is high. The metapsychology of Freud, Federn, Rappaport, Hartman, Chris has no constructs for any social system generated by more than one person at a time. Within its own framework, it has no concepts of social collectivities of experience, shared or unshared between persons. This theory has no category of you, as there is in the work of Feuerbach, Buber, Parsons. It has no way of expressing the meeting of an I with another, and of the impact of one person on another. It has no concept of me, except as objectified as the ego. The ego is one part of a mental apparatus. Internal objects are other parts of this system. Another ego is part of a different system or structure. How two mental apparatuses or psychic structures or systems, each with its own constellation of internal objects, can relate to each other remains unexamined. Within the constructs the theory offers, it is possibly inconceivable. Projection and interjection do not in themselves bridge the gap between persons. Few now find central the issues of conscious and unconscious as conceived by the early psychoanalysts as two reified systems, both split from the totality of the person, both composed of some sort of psychic stuff, and both exclusively intrapersonal. It is the relation between persons that is central in theory and in practice. Persons are related to one another through their experience and through their behavior. Theories can be seen in terms of the emphasis they put on experience or on behavior and in terms of their ability to articulate the relationship between experience and behavior. The different schools of psychoanalysis and depth psychology have at least recognized the crucial relevance of each person's experience to his or her behavior, but they have left unclarified what is experience, and this is particularly evident in respect of the unconscious. Some theories are more concerned with the interactions or transactions between people without too much reference to the experience of the agents. Just as any theory that focuses on experience and neglects behavior can become very misleading, so theories that focus on behavior to the neglect of experience become unbalanced. In the idiom of games theory, people have a repertoire of games based on particular sets of learned interactions. Others may play games that mesh sufficiently to allow a variety of more or less stereotyped dramas to be enacted. The games have rules, some public, some secret. Some people play games that break the rules of games that others play. Some play undeclared games, so rendering their moves ambiguous or downright unintelligible, except to the expert in such secret and unusual games. Such people, prospective neurotics or psychotics, may have to undergo the ceremonial of psychiatric consultation, leading to diagnosis, prognosis, prescription. Treatment would consist in pointing out to them the unsatisfactory nature of the games they play, and perhaps teaching new games. A person reacts by despair more to loss of the game than to sheer object loss, that is, to the loss of his partner or partners as real persons. The maintenance of the game, rather than the identity of players, is all important. One advantage of this idiom is that it relates persons together. The failure to see the behavior of one person in relation to the behavior of the other has led to much confusion. In a sequence of an interaction between P and O, P1, O1, P2, O2, P3, O3, etc., P's contribution, P1, P2, to P3 is taken out of context, and direct links are made between P1, P1, P3. This artificially derived sequence is then studied as an isolated entity or process, and attempts may be made to explain it, find the etiology, in terms of genetic constitutional factors or intrapsychic pathology. Object relations theory attempts to achieve, as Guntrip has argued, a synthesis between the intra and the interpersonal. Its concepts of internal and external objects, of closed and open systems, go some way, 
yet it is still objects, not persons, that are in question. Objects are the what, not the whereby, of experience. The brain is itself an object of experience. We still require a phenomenology of experience, including so-called unconscious experience, of experience related to behavior, of persons related to persons, without splitting, denial, depersonalization, and reification, all fruitless attempts to explain the whole by the part. Transaction, systems, games can occur and can be played in and between electronic systems. What is specifically personal or human? A personal relationship is not only transactional, it is trans-experiential, and herein is its specific human quality. Transaction alone, without experience, lacks specific personal connotations. Endocrine and reticuloendothelial systems interact. They are not persons. The great danger of thinking about man by means of analogy is that the analogy comes to be put forward as homology. Why do almost all theories about depersonalization, reification, splitting, denial, tend themselves to exhibit the symptoms they attempt to describe? We are left with transactions, but where is the individual? The individual, but where is the other? Patterns of behavior, but where is the experience? Information and communication, but where is the pathos and sympathy, the passion and compassion? Behavior therapy is the most extreme example of such schizoid theory and practice that proposes to think and act purely in terms of the other, without reference to the self of the therapist or the patient, in terms of behavior without experience, in terms of objects rather than persons, it is inevitably, therefore, a technique of non-meeting, of manipulation and control. Psychotherapy must remain an obstinate attempt of two people to recover the wholeness of being human through the relationship between them. Any technique concerned with the other without the self, with behavior to the exclusion of experience, with the relationship to the neglect of the persons in relation, with the individuals to the exclusion of their relationship, and most of all, with an object to be changed rather than a person to be accepted, simply perpetuates the disease it purports to cure. And any theory not founded on the nature of being human is a lie and a betrayal of man. An inhuman theory will inevitably lead to inhuman consequences if the therapist is consistent. Fortunately, many therapists have the gift of inconsistency. This, however endearing, cannot be regarded as ideal. We are not concerned with the interaction of two objects, nor with their transactions within a dyadic system. We are not concerned with the communication patterns within a system comprising two computer-like subsystems that receive and process input and emit outgoing signals. Our concern is with two origins of experience in relation. Behavior can conceal or disclose experience. I devoted a book, The Divided Self, to describing some versions of the split between experience and behavior, and both experience and behavior are themselves fragmented in a myriad different ways. This is so even when enormous efforts are made to apply a veneer of consistency over the cracks. I suggest the reason for this confusion lies in the meaning of Heidegger's phrase, the dreadful has already happened. Psychotherapists are specialists in human relations but the dreadful has already happened. It has happened to us all. The therapists, too, are in a world in which the inner is already split from the outer. The inner does not become outer, and the outer become inner just by the rediscovery of the inner world. That is only the beginning. As a whole generation of men, we are so estranged from the inner world that there are many arguing that it does not exist, and that even if it does exist, it does not matter. Even if it has some significance, it is not the hard stuff of science. And if it is not, then let's make it hard. Let it be measured and counted. Quantify the heart's agony and ecstasy in a world in which, when the inner world is first discovered, we are liable to find ourselves bereft and derelict. For without the inner, the outer loses its meaning, and without the outer, the inner loses its substance. We must know about relations and communications. But these disturbed and disturbing patterns of communication reflect the disarray of personal worlds of experience whose repression, denial, splitting, interjection, projection, etc. 
whose general desecration and profanation our civilization is based upon. When our personal worlds are rediscovered and allowed to reconstitute themselves, we first discover a shambles, bodies half dead, genitals disassociated from heart, heart severed from head, heads disassociated from genitals, without inner unity, with just enough sense of continuity to clutch at identity, the current idolatry, torn body, mind, and spirit by inner contradictions pulled in different directions, man cut off from his own mind, cut off equally from his own body, a half-crazed creature in a mad world. When the dreadful has already happened, we can hardly expect other than that the thing will echo externally the destruction already wrought internally. We are all implicated in this state of affairs of alienation. This context is decisive for the whole practice of psychotherapy. A psychotherapeutic relationship is therefore a research, a search constantly reasserted and reconstituted for what we have all lost, and which some can perhaps endure a little more easily than others, as some people can stand lack of oxygen better than others. And this research is validated by the shared experience of experience regained in and through the therapeutic relationship in the here and now. True, in the enterprise of psychotherapy, there are regularities, even institutional structures, pervading the sequence, rhythm, and tempo of the therapeutic situation viewed as process, and these can and should be studied with scientific objectivity. But the really decisive moments in psychotherapy, as every patient or therapist who has ever experienced them knows, are unpredictable, unique, unforgettable, always unrepeatable, and often indescribable. Does this mean that psychotherapy must be a pseudo-esoteric cult? No, we must continue to struggle through our confusion, to insist on being human. Existence is a flame which constantly melts and recasts our theories. Existential thinking offers no security, no home for the homeless. It addresses no one except you and me. It finds its validation when, across the gulf of our idioms and styles, our mistakes, errings, and perversities, we find in the other's communication an experience of relationship established, lost, destroyed, or regained. We hope to share the experience of a relationship, but the only honest beginning, or even end, may be to share the experience of its absence.